We advocate for the repeal of marijuana prohibition for adults. We discuss the science, culture, and controversy about America's marijuana laws. We do not advocate or encourage any illegal activity and advise all listeners to learn their state and federal marijuana laws by visiting normal.org, N-O-R-M-L dot org. Opinions and claims made by guests and advertisers of Normal Show Live are their own and do not necessarily reflect the philosophy and policies of Normal. Listener discretion is advised. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it, and it goes down smooth. Spanning the continent to bring you the truth about cannabis and marijuana law reform. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. From the promise of legalization. Uh, and I think we need to rethink and decriminalize our marijuana laws. To the agony of prohibition. One major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. The National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws presents... Normal Show Live, Marijuana Nation. Now, here's your host, Normal's Outreach Coordinator, Radical Russ Belleville. Good day, Tokers and Tokets. Welcome. It is Tuesday, March 20th, 2012, and it's got to be 420 somewhere in the world. And a month away from 420 itself. Please make sure you've logged onto our blog at stash.normal.org and click into the We Pay Donations widget. We're at $2,800. We got 30 days to raise $4,200 total to help offset our travel costs for all the events we're going to bring to you this year. So please check it out, wepay.com or at stash.normal.org. Also joining us in here, here in the studio, we got a full crew. Ganja John is over here on camera too. How you doing, John? What's up, Russ? I'm uh, doing good how about yourself uh, i'm doing great uh, we're gonna be talking more in hour two with ganja john and everyone else here in studio including wiz coleco who's here hi wiz coleco hello hi everybody just gonna be here doing a little homework today yes yes we'll talk in hour two about uh, your university as well yeah a little drug ring bust oh my goodness by the polk county sheriff appreciate that we can't have any of that no. also in studio today uh, sitting in for uh, todd armstrong we've got uh, brian blank b blank has jokes in the house oh where are you i'm here you're not very loud, though, that's Hello. for sure. I'm going to turn Hello. you up. Hello. Try it again. Hey. There you are. Hey. You Whoa. finally wow. exist. <laughs> wow. I feel I feel rejuvenated. Good, good. Glad to have you here. And you got the uh, toker topic for today, so what's the topic? Productivity. Oh, productivity. I can talk yeah. a whole lot about that. Yeah. Let's go to our virtual studio. We're waiting there in Grastoria, Oregon, is our senior news editor, Cannabis Carey. Hi, Carey. Hi, Russ. Hi, everybody in the studio. Carrie does our hemp headlines right after the first break. So what's in the news today? Well, today we're going to cover a couple of medical marijuana issues. First, we're going to go down to uh, Arizona and let you know how that program's coming along. Also, we've been following uh, the Montana program as uh, it's sort of kind of been in decline. I'm going to tell you all about that because their February numbers are out now. And also, we're going to go to Michigan, where a bill passed a Senate committee today that would further restrict their medical marijuana program. I'm going to tell you all about that coming up in the hemp headlines today. All right. And uh, also on today's show, after the news, we get to our 20 after break. Today's Electric Tuesday, and I've got not one, but two new videos from the Symphony of Science. Did somebody out there say science? We love science here. Science. Yeah, somebody said science out there. So two new Symphony of Science videos coming up at 20 after the hour. You'll want to stick around for those. At half past, I've got a special interview from our A Different View show that appears on uh, Monday nights here on the network with Daisy Bram from FreeMyBabies.org. She's going to tell you her story of being a legal medical marijuana patient and having her two young children taken away from her by Child Protective Services. All that and more coming up on The Normal Network. Stay tuned. You're listening to Normal Show Live, the voice of the marijuana nation. Hi, I'm Radical Russ. One of the best things about marijuana is the wonderful aroma. But when you travel a lot like I do, that aroma becomes a suspicious smell. That's why I endorse Stealth-Products.com, the leaders in smell-proof containers. From smell-proof vacuum bags to smell-proof backpacks and duffel bags, all the way to smell-proof digital safes, Stealth-Products.com has you covered. Stealth-Products.com brings you safe, secure, odorless layers of protection with activated carbon fiber. Backpacks and duffel bags are simple black so as not to attract attention with a logo or a flashy design. 
Now, nothing is perfectly odor controlled from the detection of drug dogs, but with proper vigilance, containers from Stealth-Products.com will help you avoid nosy humans. You're now listening to Elliot Beats. Stealth-Products.com. Stealth-Products.com. Aloha, this is Zion Thompson from The Green, and you're listening to Normal Show Live. Weedmaps.com. I'm Radical Russ from Normal. In my job as outreach coordinator, I travel every month, and when I'm on the road, I need a fast, accurate way to find the medical marijuana dispensaries in the area. So I turn to Weedmaps.com. Weedmaps.com has the best dispensary locator online or on your mobile device. Search by zip code or let Weedmaps find you, and in seconds you'll have the addresses, phone numbers, and customer service reviews for the medical marijuana dispensaries in the local area. Weedmaps.com also has a section devoted to helping you find a doctor who understands and recommends medical marijuana under your state's law. You can even check prices on the Medical Marijuana Stock Exchange. Coming soon, you'll even be able to find the listings of normal attorneys and chapters, local head shops and grow shops, and the best weed-friendly businesses. Weedmaps.com has the information you need to be an informed cannabis consumer. Visit Weedmaps.com today, a proud sponsor of the Normal Network. Medical marijuana, industrial hemp, consumer cannabis. It's time for this week's Normal News with Cannabis Carry. Governor Jan Brewer of Arizona had filed a lawsuit with the federal government seeking clarification that her state employees would not face prosecution for issuing state medical marijuana dispensary licenses. We told you all about that last year and last month. Arizona had passed a medical marijuana law in 2010 and it had a provision for dispensing medical cannabis. That part of the program had been put on hold by the health department on orders from the governor to wait for the outcome of her lawsuit. That lawsuit was dismissed by a federal judge and a state judge had ordered the governor to allow the program to move forward. But the U.S. attorney in Arizona is not making things any more clear for that state. In a letter that Governor Jan Brewer released, U.S. attorney Ann Birmingham Steele wrote to her just last month after the state's lawsuit was dismissed. In it, Shield doubles down on the threat against state marijuana programs, telling the Arizona governor that her office will continue to vigorously enforce federal laws against those who operate and facilitate large marijuana production facilities and marijuana production uh, facilities involving the selling of marijuana for medical use. And reminded her once again, state employees are not immune from liability under the Federal Controlled Substances Act. Her letter also said that seriously ill individual patients who use medical marijuana will not, quote, be the focus of the U.S. Attorney's Office's limited prosecutorial resources. Now, it was a similar letter that Brewer had used to file her lawsuit, seeking a promise that state workers would not face prosecution for doing their jobs. The federal judge in that case, Susan Bolton, had dismissed the case because they said that this letter did not pose an imminent threat to a state employee and was therefore not eligible for consideration from the federal court. Bolton said that Brewer could refile her lawsuit in 30 days if she collected more proof of imminent danger for state employees to do their jobs. So this time around, this letter means little to the state, and Jan Brewer said it will not change her course of allowing the program to move forward, nor will it cause her to refile her lawsuit. Will Humble, the director of the State Department of Health and Services, said that no state health employee will be allowed to volunteer to work on the medical marijuana program, and no one will be forced to work on it either. They are working on a training program for the state employees on how to act responsibly and safely when working on the Arizona medical marijuana program. We are still waiting for them to process their first application. Well, you know, this keeps going back to the feds saying there's nothing about this that stops us from busting people. You know, we could we could go after these people if we really wanted to. If the states want to have these licensing schemes, you know, this is the same scare tactics that was used against Governor Chafee in Rhode Island, Governor Gregoire in Washington State. Uh, it's the same. And we're going to talk a little bit more about it here at the end of the news segment in Washington State as well. But it's the same scare tactic. You know, we could go in and bust you. There's nothing about you guys doing this that means we couldn't go in and bust you. And then in the same breath, they'll say, oh, but we're not really going to go after patients. We're not really going to go after patients and caregivers and people that are really sick and who'd look really bad on the evening news with handcuffs on and make us look like real ogres. We're not going to go after those people. And yet the same justification for going after those patients is the same justification they could use to go after these states. The Controlled Substances Act, where the possession of a mere gram of marijuana or a single plant is a federal felony. So if they can choose not to use their prosecutorial resources to go after patients, 
that would give them the same latitude to not go after these state-run dispensary systems or the state workers that are involved in those state-run dis dispensary systems. It seems to me that their choice of whether or not to use prosecutorial resources depends mightily on how bad it would look for them if they tried to use them. And we have been tracking the numbers of the Montana medical marijuana program ever since the legislature changed the laws surrounding that program last summer. The number of Montana medical marijuana cardholders was 31,522, and there were 4,848 caregivers before the new restrictive law went into place on July 1st. The Cannabis Industry Association of Montana had challenged that new law, and a district judge had blocked some of the provisions of the law, but that has had little effect on the overall pressure to limit the program. The state has appealed the ruling of the blocking of some of those provisions, and the Montana Supreme Court will hear that case, along with an appeal by the industry group, starting on April 30th. But the effect of that new law on the program has been massive. At the end of February, when they released the numbers, there were only 422 caregivers who are now called providers under the law. And the number of patients enrolled in the program at the end of February was 14,364, a 10% drop from just the month before. Doctors that are registered to recommend medical marijuana to patients has also dropped from 365 before the new law passed to 263 currently. Now, overall, the program uh, has dropped about 45% of what it was uh, just less than a year ago. We will continue to monitor this development, but if the law stands as it is, we expect there to be an even larger decline this summer as the one-year mark from the implementation of this new, the new rules passes. Russ? Yeah, this is the direction uh, medical marijuana is headed, folks. These All these states, especially what I call the big six, you know, Washington, Oregon, California, Colorado, Montana, and Michigan, the big six that have those five and six digit uh, patient roles, uh, this is the direction that's headed. The legislatures in these states have consistently said they feel medical marijuana is being abused because there's so many people involved in the program. You know, it's the only government health program you can imagine where more people taking advantage of it to improve their health is a bad thing, right? Here we have a situation where in the state of Montana, they have literally decimated the number of providers there are. Decimated literally means to reduce to a factor of one-tenth, right? Decimated one-tenth the number of providers that they previously had. One-half the number of patients that they previously had. And, you know, I, I guess one way to look at it is what a miracle it is that 16, 17,000 Montanans are suddenly no longer needing medical cannabis. They must have all become healthy. They must have all recovered from their serious debilitating conditions. Well, of course not. Of course not. Of course those people are still sick and still in need of medical cannabis. They just, the hoops are too high for them to jump through anymore. And now you've got them turned either to a toxic, addictive pharmaceutical drug like Oxycontin or Vicodin uh, to, to manage their pain, or you've turned them over to a criminal black market where they risk arrest and prosecution and, and bad deals and keefed medicine and who, who, who knows what else is going on out there uh, in the illicit market. Uh, the more you continue to restrict Strict these medical marijuana laws does not mean that sick people go away or the people that want to supply the medicine goes away. Let's bring this all above ground. Let's bring it above ground, well regulated, well inspected, where we can take care of the patients, make sure they're not getting tricked or or ripped off or or, or given shoddy medicine for for their their treatment here. Why do we want to continue to drive this stuff underground? Unless, of course, you believe healthy people should be locked up for pot, and then it all makes perfect sense. And a bill that cleared a Michigan Senate committee today would remove glaucoma from the list of qualifying medical conditions that could be treated with medical marijuana. The bill that is supported by several doctors in the state's medical association was approved by a three to zero vote by the Senate Judiciary Committee, with one member abstaining from the vote. The bill's sponsor, Senator Rick Jones, a Republican from Grand Rapids, said he sponsored the bill because marijuana use neither increases the benefits of medication, nor does it ease any of the risks associated with the condition. He said physicians said that glaucoma leads to damage of the optic nerve, and it is the leading cause of blindness. He said that blindness is a horrible consequence of the disease, but the condition is not painful. He said that his worry over allowing medical marijuana uh, patients to treat glaucoma is that the patients will use it in place of other prescribed medication and their conditions will worsen. A University of Michigan ophthalmologist testified that using marijuana might relieve pleasure, uh, pressure on the optic nerve for about three hours and then testified that a person would need to smoke about 
3,000 joints to ease the condition around the clock. But that wasn't just, uh, but it just wasn't opponents of using marijuana to treat glaucoma that testified. Barbara Knox said that she uses a vaporized form of marijuana in conjunction with more traditional medicines to treat her severe glaucoma. And then she asked the committee, if they had her eyes, would they not do everything they could to ease the symptoms and prevent blindness? Activists spoke outside of the committee hearing. Their fear is that lawmakers will chip away at the uses of medical marijuana, eliminating one condition at a time. Daniel Solano of Detroit said that sick people will just seek out marijuana anyway, and removing it from the medical marijuana law will put them in danger from seeking uh, put them in danger by them seeking the marijuana illegally. Now, written testimony was also taken, and the testimony from Whitney Hickman listed the possible side effects from the pharmaceutical medications that she has to take for her glaucoma. One of the side effects of her glaucoma medications is that it can cause blindness. She said that she would rather experience the side effects of cannabis, which is euphoria, than the ones that she listed. The one senator that didn't vote on the matter, Senator Steve Bietta, a Democrat from Warren, said that he just wasn't ready to vote on the issue because he first wanted to ask his personal ophthalmologist about the disease and treatment. But whether Senator Bietta adds a yes or no to the vote, a bill, the bill is still headed for a full Senate vote sometime next month. Uh, it's just remarkable to me. The, the very first medical marijuana patient, uh, Robert Randall, sued the federal government to be able to use medical marijuana to treat his glaucoma. And he became the first federal medical marijuana patient, a program for which there are still four surviving patients. One of those surviving federal medical marijuana patients is LV Musica, a woman I've had the delightful pleasure to be around and hang out with numerous times who can only see today because of her use of marijuana. Uh, a good friend of mine who recently passed away, Bobby B, a Vietnam veteran, had very limited field of vision, but he maintained that field of vision because of his use of marijuana. And this idea that, oh my God, well, they'd have to smoke a joint every three hours. Oh no! I mean, how many times do I hear of people getting a Vicodin prescription, Oxycont, any sort of prescription out there? Make sure you take eight of these a day, one every two hours, or one with every meal. Uh, you know, John, shit, you got a whole stack of pills you got to take every day. Yeah. Why would smoking a joint every three hours be any big deal? It'd be the enjoyable part of the day, <laughs> God, as a matter of fact. Might be the only way you can get some of them pills down, come uh, to think he, of it. Uh, yeah. God. Uh, that is true, as a matter of fact. I mean, honestly, I mean, it's the only way I can get my stomach through the day to get to take all these pills. Yeah, it's just insane. Removing glaucoma as a condition, uh, again, like that person As someone who lost said, an eye from glaucoma, it can be painful. And mar marijuana can relieve that pain, so. Absolutely you know, true. It's, it's, it's like the person said in the, in the story there, they're just chipping away every little condition they can to try to remove as many people as they can from the medical marijuana rolls. It's just sick. All right, thanks, Carrie, for the news. And uh, one quick update from Washington State. You mentioned uh, Governor Jan Brewer in an earlier story. I wanted to turn to the Washington Attorney General, Rob McKenna, who's currently running for governor in Washington State. He was at a press conference today accepting the endorsement for governor from the Council of Metropolitan Police and Sheriffs in Washington State. He was asked about Washington's I-502 legalization initiative, and he said this, quote, I oppose it, and I think it's going to fail at the ballot. He argued it's, quote, a recipe for disaster if it passes, and predicted that legalization would harm those who now obtain cannabis for medicinal purposes. Trying to scare the patients here. Quote, once we open the door to all kinds of marijuana with use by all kinds of people, you know, healthy people, uh, medical marijuana users will be swept up, end quote. The attorney general added that federal penalties against marijuana possession would remain in force regardless of what state voters decide to do. McKenna noted warnings from the state's two current U.S. attorneys that they are, quote, under orders to enforce federal law. If this passes, we would be the only state to pass such a sweeping law, end quote, McKenna added. Well, that's not exactly true because Colorado could pass theirs as well, and it's much more expansive than Washington's. It allows home grow and uh, doesn't have the uh, per se DUID in it. Uh, but also what's surprising to me is just last year, Washington passed a bill, Senate Bill 5073, that would legalize dispensaries for medical marijuana patients in the state. Would have really helped out medical marijuana dispensaries. And after the governor, Gregoire, line item vetoed most of the dispensary package, the legislature asked Attorney General McKenna for clarification. And at that time, he said, 
This office has no control over enforcement of the Controlled Substances Act and cannot meaningfully predict what the United States may or may not do in that respect. Their exercise of prosecutorial discretion is dependent on the facts and circumstances of each case and interpretation of the law. You really got that out right before that uh, break. So and let's take one to congratulate that awesome cut he did. Yeah. There. Dispensaries, he doesn't know how the feds will act. But legalization, oh, he knows for sure how they'll act. Huh, I got to smoke. It's 20 after the hour. Out. And we have to take a short break, if you know what I mean. Please support these sponsors who support Normal Show Live. Oh, have you ever met that funny repo man? A repo man. Have you ever met that funny reefer man, reefer man? If he said he swam to China, he would send you South Carolina. Then you know you're talking to that reefer man. I'm Sub Cool from Team Green Avenger. At TGAgenetics.com, we are working on the leading edge of medical strains. Our strains are rigorously tested for THC, CBD, THCV, and other critical cannabinoids. Know your grow. Check out our genetic diversity at TGAgenetics.com. The home of Jelly Bean, Jack the Ripper, Vortex, and other award-winning cannabis strains. This is Normal Show Live. Hey, this is Willie Nelson for Normal. And if you're one of the 26 million Americans who smoked marijuana last year, you need to get involved in the drive to legalize marijuana. We need your help to stop the senseless arrest of more than 800,000 Americans each year on marijuana charges. Together, we can end marijuana prohibition and stop the arrest of marijuana smokers. To learn what you can do to help, contact Normal at NORML.org or call toll-free 888-67-NORML. It's time for your daily toker tunes, the best in 420 friendly music from all genres that uplifts, entertains, and informs the public. Today we bring you tunes for Electric Tuesday, our segment featuring the best of modern electric music in the genres of dance, new age, house, and experimental. If you'd like to submit your song to be played on Normal Show Live, send it to us at stash at normal.org. Now here's some more great independent marijuana music for today's Daily Toker Tunes. All right, if you followed this show for a while, you know that we are big fans of science. And speaking of science, that's the Symphony of Science. You can find these videos out at symphonyofscience.com. But you know, I was a kid that grew up on Cosmos and Carl Sagan and, and all of the, the space program stuff. I've always been, been a big fan of science fiction and, and science fact, for that matter. And uh, that's something that we like to promote here at Normal Show Live because we feel that uh, cannabis prohibition is one of the most unscientific policies ever undertaken. To that end, this Thursday is the 40th anniversary of the Schaefer Commission report uh, on marijuana. This was commissioned by uh, Richard Nixon. Uh, marijuana, a signal of misunderstanding, and uh, the commission recommended that we decriminalize not just the possession of marijuana, but the small not-for-profit transfers of marijuana from one to another. So we'll be talking with Keith Strop about that this Thursday and uh, the science that led up to their decision. But for now, a double shot, Symphony of Science, The Big Beginning, followed by The Greatest Show on Earth. Take it away, scientists. We love y'all. I'd like to start, if I may, with Professor Hawking. How did the universe start? With a Big Bang? We observe that distant galaxies are moving away from us. They must have been closer together in the past. It was the beginning of the universe and of time itself. Anything that happened before the Big Bang could not affect what happened after. The poetry of the expanding universe poetry of the complexity of life. We're not normally equipped to understand and science gives it to us. Science is opening your eyes to the wonderfulness of what's there. Science is opening your eyes to the poetry of the expanding universe. To come to you, Carl Sagan, could you help me by putting into layman's terms what was involved with this Big Bang? The early cosmos was everywhere white hot. But as time passed, the radiation expanded and cooled. Then little pockets of gas began to grow, began to grow steadily brighten. We call them the galaxies. It was the beginning of the universe and of time itself. Anything that happened before the 
And as soon as these met each other, they annihilated together. And this battle played out whilst the universe expanded. In its first minute of existence, they annihilated together. And this battle played out whilst the universe expanded. In its first minute of existence, they annihilated together. It's not all that hard to detect the Big Bang. All you need to do is change the channel until you come between two stations. All you need to do is change the channel. About 1% of the snow and north comes from the Big Bang itself. We're all eavesdropping on the birth pangs of the cosmos. It was a beginning of the universe, an empire itself. And this battle played out. Science is opening your eyes to the poetry of the expanding universe. And this battle played out. Whilst the universe expanded in its first minute of existence, it was the beginning of the universe and of time itself. Alternative Medical Choices offers healthcare the way it should be. Easy to access, patient-centered, team-based, and quality-focused. 
we offer a variety of natural, affordable healthcare treatment options like primary care, group acupuncture, massage, and assistance with OMMP registration. As a patient, you will have a team of experts working with you to make you the best you can be. Call Alternative Medical Choices at 503-288-5579 or check us out on the web at altmedchoices.com. you do? He says, Poppy walks out and he goes, hello, suck this and MF and kiss my big black stuff and suck it and stick it down in your mouth and suck it, suck it. Normal show live chat is for friends aged 18 and older. And we expect our chat to be civil, mature, and free from excessive profanity. If you don't like these rules, there are approximately six billion other chat rooms with lower standards you can visit. You cannot say filth, slime, filth, slime, filth in front of people. Tune in to the Normal Network every weekday starting at 6 p.m. Eastern for our primetime lineup. We begin with an hour of daily Toker tunes, followed by Normal Show Live and Toker Talk Radio, live from Rolla J Studios in Portland, Oregon. Then, you get two hours of recorded podcasts from national and international reformers, followed by our late-night live shows at 11 p.m. Eastern. Then the whole six-hour block repeats twice overnight. It's the Normal Network, your source for the best in marijuana media. Normal, unlike any other marijuana or drug reform organization, is built from the ground up by grassroots activists. We are the Marijuana Smokers Lobby, and we aren't just anti-prohibition, we're pro-marijuana. Every week, we take some time to talk to the citizens of local normal chapters across the country and around the world, as well as others who are working to make a difference in the fight to end adult marijuana prohibition. In this segment, we call Grassroots Activism. All right, welcome back. I wanted to highlight this next story, the story of Daisy Bram. Uh, she has a website called freemybabies.org, and it has to do with the, the tragic taking of her two very young children, Thor and Zeus, and uh, kudos to the the names. I love the names, Thor and Zeus. Can't do any better than that, Ganja John. No, you can't. <laughs> Honestly, and, that's freaking awesome. Yeah, take a couple of kids named Thor and Zeus. You better know who you're dealing with. <laughs> uh, but they uh, dropped charges, and then after they had, there were some complaints. They refi- They have refiled these child endangerment charges because these children were uh, around the presence of parents who were smoking marijuana. The catch, of course, in this story is in Butte County, California. The parents are both medical marijuana patients, perfectly legally entitled to this medicine. And the story just highlights how medical marijuana patients are still suffering under second-class citizenship. So I wanted to bring you this clip from our Monday evening show, A Different View, starring Iva Cunningham, Jennifer Alexander, and Sarah Frank, and their interview with Daisy Bram from freemybabies.org. Welcome back to A Different View. This is Jennifer, Iva, and Sarah, and we're having a great show so far. Um, we had to switch around our guests a little bit, so this this is Daisy Brom. We've got on the line now, and we talked with her a few weeks ago, mm-hmm. uh, freemybabies.org. She's from California. They had uh, a drug raid that took place, and they, the state took their babies. They did get them back, and I can hear a little bit of, of children's sounds in the background. <laughs> Wonderful. But but there's some updates, yeah. Daisy. What? Tell us what's going on now. Well, there's been we've been taking a really public stance. Um, there's been a lot of folks calling and and sort of a media blitz, if you will. And uh, initially, the I was charged with two counts of felony child abuse for consuming cannabis while breastfeeding. And uh, during our preliminary proceedings, my attorney, uh, Michael Levinson, did a phenomenal job of basically beating that down. So those charges, the judge, who is very straightforward and fair, uh, dismissed them. Good. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that was great. We figured, okay, that's, that's a huge deal because, you know, the child abuse charge, child, any child-related charges are kind of a big deal. Mm. So um, we had a suppression, mo- uh, suppression hearing on the 28th of February. Uh, to attack the validity of the search warrant, at which time there was a mention by the ADA, uh, Jeff Greason. Uh, I've taken to calling him Greasy Dumpling, actually, which I think <laughs> he knows about, honestly. And, and I don't, quite frankly, I don't care. 
he's, he's got huge earlobes and he sweats a lot and he's just kind of a greasy dumpling. So, I understand your frustration, but keep telling us. We right? need to hear the so story. I'm just trying to pay, but, you know, nonetheless. So this morning I'm checking the uh, Butte County, the Municipal Court website, just to kind of keep an update on things, and I see that I have a new case number. And he has refiled the felony child abuse and a uh, count of misdemeanor child endangerment. And the reason that that is the case is because initially they had a hair and urine sample they'd collected from my older son, Thor, but not one from my newborn because he didn't have any hair um, at the time that they had taken him. And that had come back positive for THC and THC metabolites. Well, yeah, I am a cannabis-using patient, and I have done the research to, to dispute or or prove the claim that there is no harm to children that comes from consumption of cannabis and breastfeeding. And the conclusion I came to is that it was safe. So... Yeah, I was going to say, let's, let's just throw you know, a little reality check out there the really science. quick. You know what I mean? Like, this isn't just a pothead bias. That is the science. Well, and I was going to say, let's just throw a little reality check out there really quick. Uh, it's not usually recommended that you use certain medications during pregnancy because Absolutely. either they haven't been proven safe or they've been proven unsafe. There's two different categories there, mm -hmm. though. Right. Yeah. And your doctor right. will tell you, no, it's okay for you to take this medicine in this instance, even if the bottle says, do not take dirt. Right. You know what right. I mean? Right. So this is like a case-by-case -case scenario, and any of those medicines would have shown up in the baby as well. So right. this, right. this is just reality. So this I, isn't... I, Negligence. They will a pregnant a woman sickness. Demerol in the hospital. I Absolutely. every other mm -hmm. day for the beginning of my pregnancy, Demerol after Demerol after. This is the doctor yeah. mm -hmm. giving me my Demerol. Of course, I think you think safe, it's safe. Yeah. So, so Daisy, um, do you have any idea what? What specifically uh, they're predicating the charges against you on? Is it so strictly the, what that? Going to do, one of the reasons is that, that the charges had gotten thrown up at the preliminary hearings is because they were not able to verify the certification of the lab in question that they had sent the samples to. Mm -hmm. And there was an issue with the chain of custody. Like it looked as though the samples had been collected on the 29th of September, not, but not sent away to Kansas until the 5th of October. So the judge. Um, said, well, I'm just not going to allow that. Mm -hmm. Well, that judge has since retired. And the judge that I will be arraigned, really arraigned and probably have a prelim in front of, uh, Claire Keithley, is a woman who used to work in the district attorney's office. And the, one of the, her great brainchilds is the Drug Endangered Child Investigation Unit. Ugh. So I want to bring like, up a point right here. The district attorney is figuring I'm... that, like, if I go back in front of her, there's no way she's going to let me off on anything related to children, and they can resubmit the hair and urine samples, but they don't have one for Zeus, hence the difference between the felony and the misdemeanor. So their entire case, really, I think they're trying to set precedent, quite honestly, mm -hmm. in saying mm -hmm. that cannabis consumption, positive cannabis analysis on children constitutes, a, at the that very is. least, child endangerment. And I right. want to bring up your point that you mentioned earlier, Daisy, is, you know, you did the research, and we've all done the research, and... Yep. It's laughable to be charged with yeah. child endangerment mm -hmm. and injury to a child for a non-toxic substance, and that's what we need to be addressing. Right. There's, there's is how least... is it a danger? How is it child abuse if it can't hurt them? And they're saying that it can hurt them. And I was going to say mm -hmm. there's multiple scientific that. studies. Um, there was one that I evaluated a while back on my blog. Um, about uh, the mortality rate oh, yeah, for children yeah, two that. years mm -hmm. and younger, you know, mm -hmm. for the first two years of yeah. their life, whether it's natural causes or homicide or uh, birth defects or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. just the likelihood that they would die. And the cannabis consuming mm -hmm. parents, their babies were the least likely to die. In fact, the zero, margin. zero babies right. died from cannabis only, whereas the opium, which clearly, uh, appeared to be related to the Demerol and morphine kind of products that they would mm -hmm. give yeah. you during childbirth. So we're not talking mm -hmm. about drug addicted mothers, but those that were strictly taking yeah, doctor recommended doctor. drugs mm -hmm. were more likely yeah. to die, although well, I less think we've learned likely. that just I mean, because it, was, it says doctor recommended or it's prescribed by a doctor doesn't necessarily mean, or but, it's, you know, monitored by the FDA. Right, right. right. There's, there's two yeah. more studies, though. One of them is that they did on rice, or on mice, rice, on mice, that um, it, it 
improved the suckling of mm -hmm. infants and actually overcame yeah. failure to thrive. So this is saving babies' lives mm -hmm. in that case. And right. cannabinoids are in our bodies from birth. And of course, right. we have to bring up Melanie Dreyer and her wonderful research in Jamaica that she did. Bingo. You know? That yeah. was the third oh, one I was going to bring up. The studies that have needed Mothers that have done it yes. regularly in large, mm -hmm. diverse yes. groups it's... instead of a subculture like yes. here and in the United States. And the ones States. who were breastfeeding mm -hmm. while using it. And, and well, even one of the, the DEA's administrative knowing. judge says that it's non-toxic from 1988. Right. We need to be talking about why is this law still saying that it's a danger to children? How is it acceptable to put Daisy and her children through this? We make them forced to explain the danger. Yeah, so Daisy, as you can this. see, we're all passionate about this, and I'm so glad that you're standing oh, up sure. fighting about well, this because it's important. One of the things that's important. worth noting is that I had Zeus, the younger of which, at home on my own. I'm a self-taught midwife, so I administered all my prenatal, my records are impeccable, and I had it was just myself and um, my husband present, so we had him at home. So I made the determine for myself, for determination for myself after birth. Of like, damn, I need to smoke some pot. That was pretty rough. <laughs> um, and when I, I had my first baby in the hospital, um, they were like, "What do you want?" And I was like, "I don't want anything." Like they're like, "We got it here." You know, like I felt like I was dealing with a pusher on the street. Uh -huh. So I could have had the baby in the hospital, and like you said, Demerol or whatever the cocktail of like. No, Mind literally, they hook you up where you here. can push a button for your Demerol as often as yeah. you bring your it. baby to breastfeed. <laughs> what upset me the most is when I went into the hospital pregnant, you know, they didn't ask me if I wanted Demerol. Mm -mm. They just gave it to me because I was screaming yeah. in pain. They they did mm. that to me, too. They just they gave it to me, and I'm like, what was that? And they're like, oh, it's just Demerol. Yeah, because now I'm Oh, you don't think I might have wanted to say in that? <laughs> I'm kind of pregnant and, here. And, and there's pictures of me. I, I am the most doped up. I I've, I've, yes. I don't get drunk. I don't mm. get blazing high. And I look flaked out. I'm like, <laughs> and it was because of what they gave me. I mean, they well, I know that, legal drugs. You know, I, I know that with the breastfeeding of the children, I, 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 I they'll give you Oxycontin mm -hmm. and while yeah. you're breastfeeding mm -hmm. and it's no big deal. They'll, you know, they, they don't seem so to. So it's time to talk about that. And it's an unfortunate that Daisy has to go through things like this to be able to have us talking about this. Mm -hmm. But that's why well, we're. Well, and the issue is I'm on, I'm prescribed Marinol right now. <laughs> Dang. So they're okay with the synthetic. THC, of course. Which, by the way, they can't tell the difference between. That's one of the reasons that we <coughs> that I was, we were able to fight off CPS is that mm -hmm. I had gotten Marino. a Marinol, and they said, "Oh, we can't recognize that." And I said, "Like hell, you can't. You have to." Right. Mm -hmm. Like we can argue about the Canada, so you have to recognize. But this is Marino. FDA approved, yeah. right? Right. But they don't have to recognize so, state law cannabis. You know, medical mm -hmm. cannabis. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so the child. So you take me into criminal court on the same grounds. Well, now, what are you guys okay with the Marinol too? Like that is so transparent and ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I, you know, it's it blows my mind. So it's yeah, no, this is all. It's all part of a just a wearing down. Um, but I, I've sort of taken on a new mission for me, and I'm not. Um, if anything, I'm ever more committed. To, um, well, good for you asserting, because I think they're asserting their rights. But you know what I mean? Because this is the reality: is that like women smoke pot and women have babies, and like, right. a lot of women don't want to admit it because there's a stigma attached to it. But I have no shame. I think cannabis is great, and babies are great, and breastfeeding is great, and they should mm -hmm. all do it together. We so. gave it to our babies <laughs> prior to prohibition. Da Daisy, prohibition. I don't know if you caught the beginning of the show, um, but we were talking about an article by Michelle Alexander: "Go to trial, crash the justice system." And there's some stories in there that I think you can relate to. And I think one of the strongest arguments against uh, basically refusing to plea out, defending yourself, fighting, standing up for your rights, you know, this whole, how you're being so public and, and willing to stand strong. A lot of people don't have the guts to do that or the willingness to do that. And that's mm -hmm. part of why our system is beating us so badly. And so I just want right. to thank you again for being willing to, to fight it. Have I mean, I know, I know how hard well, it's got to be. Well, it's not even for, for me, it's for my kids. I want right. to be able, you know, I'm like, be proud of what I've done with myself and how I stood up for their rights. And like, mm -hmm. I can't criticize anybody for how, what path they choose to take, but quite honestly, I don't know what sort of mother I would be if I just laid down and took it. This is ridiculous. Well, and one of like, the I quotes... I would want this to happen to my grandchildren. Like, this is ridiculous. One like, of the no, quotes that... Not... Um... Iva read from this article by Michelle Alexander pointed out that even in taking the plea deal, they can take your kids. <laughs> so, 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 so you're still losing your kids, yeah. Right. So, I mean, th thank you so much for standing up. We need we need more people fighting. Absolutely. This thank fight. you guys. You have a fantastic show. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. It well, really you. It, it means a lot to me and my family. Well, thank you. And do keep us posted. I mean, mm -hmm. like I said, this 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 Absolutely. conversation is important. The, so few people are out there absolutely. fighting it that we need to. The website 
website is great. The Facebook is great. Like, I'm, I'm really trying to make sure to keep all that updated. So and it's freemybabies.org. Free it's freemybabies, all one word, lowercase, dot org. Excellent. So you can, you can Google it, if nothing else, and you'll find us somewhere. So Excellent. really, just make contact. If anybody needs any assist on a, assistance as dealing with CPS, especially mm-hmm. in a cannabis-related issue, I am a wealth a geyser of information, and I know how to get kids back. So please contact me with that regard as well. Excellent. Thank Thank you you so much. You, you, All right. Thank you. Thank that's you. That's just so obscene. The felony child abuse charges for breastfeeding under the influence of cannabis. Anyway, we're going to take a short break. And when we come back, Brian Blank has your daily toker topic to lighten the mood. We're going to talk about productivity and a little radical rant at the end of the show. Stick around. You're listening to Normal Show Live, the voice of the marijuana nation. Starfish Designs, makers of the original Gandalf. I'm Radical Russ, and when I want to relax, I always have my 17-inch-long original Gandalf from Starfish Designs nearby. The hand-blown borosilicate glass is strong and easy to clean, and the design is sleek and sophisticated. Starfish Designs are available from Bend, Oregon at a glass retailer near you. For locations, call 541-788-GLASS. That's 541-788-4527. Hey, tokers and toquettes, this is Radical Russ from Normal Show Live. We're proud to be the voice of the marijuana nation and proud to have you on our team. Now, you can represent NSL in your own normal show live gear from handmadeapparel.biz. Adam Hand of Handmade Apparel is one of us and a huge supporter of our show. He's designed the classic blockhead line of NSL shirts, hoodies, hats, and more. Worn by Radical Russ, Cannabis Carry, and Ganja John on the show and at live events, The designs feature their iconic logos and the It's Got to Be 420 Somewhere in the World tagline. Proceeds directly benefit Normal Show Live and HandmadeApparel.biz, one of our community's strongest supporters. You can also get your Cannabis Cure UK, Ganja John Show, Irie Island Hour, and more gear from the Normal Network at HandmadeApparel.biz. Visit HandmadeApparel.biz today. Here at Normal Show Live, we spend all week taking a look at the tragedy of American marijuana prohibition. But it's important to take a break and remember that we are a vibrant, diverse, and oftentimes hilarious community of people. So our friend, comedian Todd Armstrong, joins us to poke fun at one of Todd's toker topics. Yeah. All right, well, we don't know what drunk yeah. tank uh, Todd's all locked up in today. So we got Brian <laughs> Blank here sitting in. What's up, Brian? How's it going, guys? Glad to have you here, and uh, we're going to let everyone know the uh, Twitter is Brian B. Blank. B. Blank has, has jokes. jokes. B. Blank has jokes. So yeah. check that out. So yeah. uh, Brian's take, sitting in here, pinch hitting, as, yeah. as you were, yes. uh, for Todd Armstrong for the Toker topic today, which is productivity. Take it away. Well, I'm tired of hearing that if you smoke, you won't accomplish anything. All right, listen. I worked as a pizza delivery guy. I've painted houses. I work in the restaurant industry, and I'm a comedian. All right. For the summer that I painted houses, we would bake three to four bowls right before we would go do the prep work. Then we would then we'd go to lunch, bake three to four more bowls, paint the house. And then day two was just touch ups. And then we would celebrate our above average but finished job with five to six bowls. (laughs) Yeah. All right. Uh, As a pizza delivery guy, I once got a flat tire and uh, the manager of the place picked me up. With a bowl in hand ready for me to smoke. <laughs> nice place to work. All right. If you've ever been to a restaurant before, there's an 85% chance that your server is high taking your order, <laughs> thinking to themselves, that sounds good. I'm going to get that later. <laughs> and then goes back and eats some free bread. I do comedy high all the time. All right. Today, today I walked into a grocery store and was developing a character of mine. <laughs> called Professor Roni, all right? I wasn't just walking around the grocery store laughing to myself about Professor Roni. I was being productive. (laughs) (laughs) My point is that I'm tired of people saying that stoners are lazy. Maybe you can't handle your pot, but I can. And besides, we all know that alcoholics are, are the true lazy ones. (laughs) <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brian Blank. And uh, we also want to find out, uh, of course, Portland is the comedy mecca. If you haven't been to Portland and seen some good comedy, uh, you got to get out here. Plenty of places to see it. And where will you be next? 
Uh, I am, uh, I'm hosting a show at uh, Blitz Sports Pub April 1st. Todd's going to be headlining that. Uh, and then I have a couple shows uh, in Denver that you guys might go to uh, if you're in Denver. All right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Not if you're here because yeah. Denver's far away. Yeah. And also in Portland coming up uh, next month in less than a month now. Uh, is Bridgetown, which Brian did not get accepted yeah. to, and uh, neither did Todd. Yeah. So you can go and not see them at Bridgetown, and well, you, you can, can go laugh. see uh, Janine Garofalo and <laughs> uh, John Glazer and all kinds of really cool, famous people, including friends of the show, Ron Funches, Ian Carmel, all kinds of fun people. When is Bridgetown? And we will be there April 15th, 16th. 17th, something like that. Yeah, there's, it's, it's a lot it's, of days. Bridgetown.com. You guys got to check it out. It's, it's uh, all over Portland. Yeah, the the newest up and coming uh, comedy festival in Portland. Come check it out. We'll be there covering the hell out of it. So we'll have exclusive Ganja exclusive John. Exclusive backstage with Doug Benson, which oh. is confirmed, and uh, all kinds of cool stuff. We're going to have a really good time. All sorts of great stuff coming up on the normal network uh, from every angle. We got music, we got comedy, we got the news, the opinion, the analysis. It's all going to be right here on Normal Network. Make sure you stay tuned with us. And uh, if you want to get the, uh, if you want to get our, uh, Full schedule of events and full schedule of shows. Just check out the normal audio video department, normal.org slash AV for audio video, right? Normal.org slash AV. You'll get the full schedule. Uh, there's also a Google calendar there you can subscribe to. And as the schedule changes and as we post more information on the shows, it'll go right to your Android or Google powered device. So check that out. Normal.org slash AV. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, it'll be time for Radical Rant. Stick around. Don't touch that dial. We'll be right back after a word from these 420 friendly sponsors. Uh, wait a minute. This is internet radio. There are no dials here. legalize marijuana prove it join normal today at norml.org and your donation will help us spread the growing truth about cannabis free speech ain't free you know free the ganja tree it's the healing of the nation free the kali weed good for meditation free the pot smokers the rain of the light lighting up the chalice they keep no malice free the marijuana come on come on come on say free the marijuana give me give me give me say free the marijuana you want answers? I'm as bad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. You want answers? You have offended my family. I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth. And you have offended a Shaolin temple. You can't handle the truth. Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. Hoorah! Radical Brandt. All right, folks, did a little more research uh, today on marijuana legalization. I was kind of curious as to how many times, how many chances, I guess I should say, have there been to make that first domino fall? We all kind of recognize that marijuana prohibition is not going to end at a federal level. It's not going to just happen through a magical act of Congress. I mean, I guess maybe it could, but it's just doubtful. More likely that the end of prohibition of marijuana is going to be like the end of prohibition of alcohol. It'll happen state by state. And that means some state has to be the first one to take that move, which is the first state to actually legalize marijuana. Now, I know there's a lot of debate among some people here uh, in, in the marijuana community as to what legalization really means. I've come up with a pretty simple definition for myself. If there's a knock on my door at one in the morning and I go downstairs in my robe smoking a joint and there's a police officer standing there and at the end of our conversation, I get to go back to bed with my joint, marijuana's legal. Okay, we can work out the rest of the details of where I'm where going to buy it, where am I going to grow it, whatever. If I can talk to a cop with a joint in my hand, marijuana is legal. So this year, of course, we have two states that are vying to be that first state to topple the domino. We got Washington State with uh, I-502, the initiative that would legalize an ounce and uh, the sales, retail sales and wholesale you know, cultivation, but wouldn't have home grow and controversially has that five nanogram per milliliter DUID provision. 
And we've got Colorado's regulate marijuana like alcohol, which would legalize an ounce of possession, six plants and all your harvest from those six plants at the grow site, uh, as well as the retail sales and uh, wholesale commercial uh, cultivation. Neither of these initiatives would affect medical marijuana. Both of them state that, you know, in their language that, hey, Nothing about this changes medical. You'll still have medical, but it just legalizes for the healthy people. So with respect to that, I wanted to point out a couple of things. Number one, uh, we've got a poll up on Washington's I-502. The question is, Washington's I-502 legalizes an ounce and or but creates a five nanogram per milliliter per se DUID. Would you vote for it? Now, when I first put this up, uh, it was about 67 percent. Yes. In favor. And then I felt the votes come in from the I-502 opponents that drove it down to as low as 62% on the Stash blog. Uh, now with 774 votes in, it is back up to above 70%. It's at 70% right now in favor of 502 with 30% opposed. Of course, this is a completely unscientific self-selected poll, so make of it what you will, which is, you know, take it with a a salt lick, not just a grain of salt. But still, uh, if you'd like to participate in the poll, it's up at our blog at stash.normal.org. Now, with respect to this legalization and the chances that we get, I, I did some research today and I found that in all of the history of the 40 plus years of marijuana prohibition, and, and more specifically the war on drugs as declared by Richard Nixon. Of course, marijuana prohibition goes farther back than that. But in the 40 years, 40 plus years of Nixon's war on drugs, there have been 10 times where marijuana legalization has made the statewide ballot. 10 times that this has happened. And we have to understand that in America, there are only 23 states that, are, that you have the ability to petition, where you can put together a petition to get something on the ballot that's a statewide initiative. Some of them can be constitutional amendments, some of them can only be statutes, but regardless, the people can only put out a petition in 23 states, and Mississippi just got that right back in 1992. So before 92, there were only 22 states where you could put out initiatives. Of those 23 states, only six western states, Alaska, California, Colorado, Nevada, Oregon, and Washington, have ever managed to succeed at placing a legalization initiative before the state's voters. Those six states account for just 10 successful tries out of a potential 494 opportunities to place legalization on the ballot. Now, I've got the tables up at the blog at stash.normal.org, but basically I outline all the states that could have put legalization on the ballot 22 of them up until 1992, 23 of them after that, and how many actually did put marijuana legalization on the ballot, and again, only 10 times out of 494 attempts. So your chance of getting true legalization on the ballot next time, uh, not always that guaranteed. In fact, the chances are generally against it. If you have a chance to vote on legalization, it's best that you probably do so. Twice, California's voted on legalization. In 1972, Prop 19 attempted to legalize personal use and cultivation without any sort of well-defined limits for all adults 18 and older, and it generated 33.5% support. 28 years later, they got their second chance, which was also called Prop 19, and it attempted to legalize one ounce of marijuana and a 25-square-foot personal garden for all adults 21 and older, it generated the greatest support yet at 46.5%. Two other states have had two shots at marijuana legalization. Alaska tried it for 18 and older in 2000 and got about 41%. Tried personal use for 21 and older four years later, got about 44%. Nevada tried three ounce legalization for 21 and older in 2002 and got about 39%. Then four years later, lowered it to one ounce and got 44%. Oregon tried to legalize for 18 and older in 1986 and got the lowest vote total, 24% back then. 12 congressional elections later, many attempts have been made to get marijuana legalization on the Oregon ballot, and all have failed. So, Washington State has never had marijuana legalization on the ballot until this year. Colorado had legalization on the ballot this year, and they had a failed attempt in 2006 that generated 41% support. So if it is not crystal clear my opinion on this, let me uh, just make it even more crystal. If you get a chance and you're lucky enough to live in a state, six out of 23 states that have initiatives that have ever tried it, six out of 50 states that have any chance of 
putting this before the voters and you get that chance to vote for legalization, you got to take it. You got to take that shot. The chance of you getting it on the ballot again is not guaranteed. And when billionaires funding these things mount loss after loss, they tend to look elsewhere as to where they're going to spend their money for legalization. And the legalization attempts get more and more restrictive. Three ounces becomes an ounce. Cultivation at home becomes no home cultivation. We get new DUID provisions. Take the shot now. Get your rights. We'll fix the rest later. This is Normal Show Live, the voice of the marijuana nation. We'll talk more about this in Hour 2 here at Toker Talk Radio. You can call in at 971-533-7111. For Brian Blank, Wiz Calico, Ganja John, and Cannabis Carry, I'm Radical Russ. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, take care of each other, Tokers. You're listening to the Normal Show Live.